mine into your icy blues. And then I'd say to you, we could take to the highway with this trunk of ammunition too. I'd end my days with you in a hail of bullets. for joining us on our podcast load bearing beams is that how you meant to come in it was sweet yeah i figured i'd try sweetness <sighs> oh, okay and now my sweetness who Holy. hates when i give a really meandering explanation of what our podcast is Did is gonna even... tell you what it is Lacey. what's our podcast about did you already say your name matt i'm so distracted by the sweetness uh-huh uh i'm Lacey roth we are a married couple and we're here to discuss with you Load, a load-bearing beam of mine, actually. What's a load-bearing beam? Well, thank you for asking. It is a movie from your distant past that you have a deep connection, fondness for. Um, one you haven't seen in a long time, but your default, when anyone mentions the movie or if anyone asked you about how you felt about it, I would be like, oh my god, it's amazing. And it's the sort of, you can tell that it's a load-bearing beam of yours if when someone asks, if when someone admits that they have not seen it, your reaction is... Why are you alive? What the fuck? How have you missed this treasure? So you insist you watch it. Now you've built it up beyond recognition. And the question here is, what we discuss here is, was it good? What, what was the deal with that? Why did, it, why did it stick to you? Why did it become part of your foundation? Um, and if it turns out that it was bad, do you think you're going to reset to the next time someone mentions grumpy old men to, <laughs> it's excellent. <laughs> like, it, me and Matt are discovering that we have a different connection to our beams. Matt, Matt seems like he could be remodeled if he were home, uh, even if it's supporting the weight of the roof, <laughs> where I tend to I have such a short memory of specifics that even when I realize something's bad, I still default to, yeah, recommend, plus sign, thumbs up. Yeah, even if we will have, like, a very clinical breakdown of a movie. Sobering. Yeah, and, and we're like, boy, you know, with with with, with uh, distant eyes, with objective eyes, and decades of experience Hungry and wisdom, eyes. suddenly I realize the movie's not that great. And then, like, six months later, I somebody mean. brings up the movie, and you're like, I love that movie. I know, but I think what I'm trying to express is something different. I, I, me and that movie! I know that we're best. It's I more saw like, that movie. No, it's like that's my best friend. I, like it's just this is the whole essence of the situation. My connection and attachment to these things make it personal. Like I know him too. It's huh. very, all right. Yeah, because of the two of us, I'm the bigger fan of stuff. So I'm surprised to hear you say, like, it definitely seems like you're more attached to things. Atta- than right. I am. I'm totally willing to things in the dust behind. Mm-hmm. Huh. Well, that's what, yeah, that's the main difference. It's the main Mine difference. Mine seems to be emotional. And yours is pragmatic. Very professorial, you know? Oh, fuck. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, Professor. like I said, clinical. I take a very, you know, a keen eye and look at these things. Are we still talking about is the intro still? This is, this is the stuff <laughs> this is she, doesn't short, like, she doesn't like me this to is uh, the expand short intro. on her, <laughs> on her explanation. So, Expanded like she said, listen, if I learned anything from my days as a, in the legal world, it's that you oh. tell a jury what you're going to tell Are them. Are those over? <laughs> sure. You tell a jury what you're going to tell them, you tell it to them, and then you told them what you told them. And so, Lord Bring Beam's movie, saw it a long time ago. And uh, we're talking about The Crow. Uh, uh-huh. 1994 is The Crow. The Crow. This is Lacey's film. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it is her film. Why, why do you say that? I don't know. I just, it came out like that. So I forgot to double down. Oh, you're relating. All right. It is her movie. But um, it, you're making it sound like it's an, it's quintessential load bearing beam for me, but I don't think that's true. It's not. What is the quintessential load bearing beam? Something with bikes in a, um, a set around what the fifties or the sixties. Yeah. So you have like two, you have two, um, tropes <laughs> two big two big things that you like in movies or like two well, big can, types can of movies can i just say like. that this is not something i had in, i did not know this about myself it's not something that is um 
I'm not seeking it out, but you know, in doing this podcast for a year or more, I, we have we have noticed patterns. And my pattern is what, Matt? So two patterns. You have the pattern where it's a movie set in the 50s or the 60s. There's kids with bikes and there's a town square. There's usually a death um, or at least some traumatic thing happens to one of the characters. And um, there's like doo-wop or something playing on the soundtrack. Okay. And usually there's like a wraparound story, like the modern uh, person's looking back on the childhood. And then the other is you like witchcraft and the occult. Is that a thing of mine? Sure. The craft. This. That's only two. You can't make a little. Oh, damn it. Remember, on that episode. Edward Scissorhands was going to be one of mine, but you, that's all, you already saw it, so I couldn't use it. No, we, we did an episode about yeah, Beetlejuice. We, oh, Beetlejuice. Well, there you go. That's like, talk, that's like an ultimate goth movie right there. We were very, we stuck very much to the format of the show back then. Casper. And then we were like, <laughs> no, wait, it, let's talk about The Tim Adams Burton. Family. Okay, you're right. I do have a theme. Uh, we'll get back to Tim Burton because I, I feel we? Tim Burton's a big presence in this movie. I think. you feel that mm-hmm. I feel much more. Well, OK, yeah. In in the Batman situation. Right. He did one of the Batman, didn't he? We have so much to talk about. OK. Fuck. Uh, how do we even start? I guess. let's. So the, the crow. Way we the, always do. The crow. We'll start the way we always start. Yeah. Which is to say that the title of the movie is The Crow. The year it came out is 94 and it was directed by Alex Preuss. Now, here's the part where you asked me my connection to the movie Lacey do you remember the other Alex Proyas movie we've talked about on you the said podcast knowing. knowing knowing is one of them the Nicolas Cage movie where he's like what's, what's up with these know. numbers what do they mean lacking of knowledge they're on predicting 9-11 and now they're predicting something even bigger and how do the I stop the birth of it? a crow oh and um I love that movie I Alex Proyas I know. It's one of is, your a, is a uh, fascinating character in that he's never really had a big hit. I guess I Robot is the closest. I guess the Crow is a the Crow is a pretty big hit. But he seems to be he benefited from the death. He's kind of his 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 he's sort of like Tim Burton without the kitsch because he's very into the set design. Like that's a very important element of his set movies. design was at first yes a very was very into the set design of this movie. Uh huh. And reading reviews from the time that this movie came out, they all referenced Tim Burton's Batman, like how much he seemed to be inspired. I mean, it literally looks like it. a pop out from a comic book. This, yeah. the, even the buildings look cut out. They His, glow red behind each building because of the fires. There was this early 90s comic movie boom that came after Batman. None of them. I guess The Crow is the second most successful. I didn't even. I, I n- would have never put in. I didn't realize it was comic book. I mean, of course, it screams it when you're looking at it now. But I would have had no idea it was yeah, a comic Yeah, this book. was based on a comic book. But it was. it's funny in retrospect, like it's movie studios. We're like, let's adapt all these comic books, but they weren't adapting superheroes. Well. <laughs> they were adapting oh, right. like pulp detectives, like Dick Tracy. <laughs> right? No, you're right. Let's oh, let's introduce a animated bunny. Yeah. <laughs> we like and the noir. But... It would take them like 20 more years before they're like, ooh, let's just do the superheroes, and now every movie is a superhero. Right. But um, so Proyas, after that, he did Dark City, which is a really great movie uh sort of like sci-fi dystopian movie about this weird town a town that looks a lot like the town in the crow who plays with like where like every night these evil scientists sneak into everybody's homes and give them an injection that makes them turn into a completely different person because they're like trying to experiment with what identity means and mm-hmm. how how somebody if, if suddenly you woke up tomorrow morning with totally different memories are you indeed a different person right Anyway, that's I haven't seen that in a long time, but that's a really great movie. And then after that, he did I Robot, Knowing, and then Gods of Egypt. And he is a very um, angry Australian man. Why do you call him angry? He's always angry at critics for not liking his movies because most critics well, don't like any of his movies. Oh. I think they um, don't give him a break because he's Australian and he sounds. I think that adorable. I think they hate Australians. Critics and, uh, do? No. Oh, I'm joking. You got me. But uh, I found his YouTube channel, and it's Was got it hard to find. It wasn't hard. Just typed in Alex Proyas on YouTube and it popped right up. But like his most watched video has like 900 views. Oh, that's. And it's like that's the graphic up. design is beautiful. Like he's got a designer who's like making great cares. thumbnails and stuff. Right. Yeah. And then it's like live stream. Ask Alex anything. 704 views. Mm. And no one on the live stream. It was an empty stream. Yeah. Him pissing S- into the wind. But I, I think it's interesting that. That's yeah, I feel like people have separated the director from the movie because 
just his affiliation with this movie alone should give him some kind of fandom. It certainly, certainly does. Like, uh, to movie people, they know who he is. views kind of fan. I mean, they know who he is, but it doesn't seem like they like him. Yeah. Yeah, he's just maybe not likable. I don't know if he has a thing, because you just from the first, from this, from Crow and Dark City, you'd think he's sort of a Tim Burton figure I see what who you're likes. Saying. Yeah, his shit's all over the place. But then after that, he kind of becomes more mainstream, a little quirky, but just kind of sort of aspiring to, like, a, um, like, Roland Emmerich, the guy who made uh, Independence Day, like that kind of level of yeah, Hollywood filmmaking. Like. I don't know. Yeah, no, but I think knowing, yeah, knowing's like a great example of how well a movie like that can work. Nothing more. But anyway, what yeah. did this movie mean to you? Okay, the thanks. All right, so this is a little different for me, but I'm starting to disagree with myself <laughs> because I, the, for me, a staple of it being a load bearing beam would be how many times I've watched it. And I, I totally understand now watching it why I wouldn't have watched this movie a whole lot. So I was going to say today's the first time we're talking about a beam I faked. Um, just the, I knew it would meant a certain thing about me if I said that I liked it or that I quoted it or that I think I even went for Halloween as the crow a couple times. Um, you know, it, it meant it's a shorthand for the kind of person I was. Um, and very, very cool people, or at least people I perceived as cool because they were deep or fucked up. I don't know. Um, they, you know, would, can't, write, can't write all the time on their notebooks, blood dripping or whatever the hell they did. I think I felt like this beam was, uh, or this movie, I wasn't cool enough to claim it. So I never, but then watching it, it's got a lot of stuff that I would have really been drawn to but it's dark and so because it's dark and because my thoughts were dark i wasn't the kind of person that wanted to like waddle in that for too long so it wouldn't have been something i watched a lot so i'm anyway i'm i'm waffling between yeah this is a beam i definitely faked and yeah you can fake a beam i've done it it's got Um, no 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 i don't mean faked a beam here i mean i faked a beam in life yeah i know okay well then shut up i i would like to i i thought it'd be a fun game to to do like what what things have you pretended to like (laughs) Well, you pretend to like black and white movies. I already know that. You pretend to like jazz. I, I'm so <laughs> fucking angry at you. How dare you? You pretend to like top hats for like three months. Top, yeah. Okay. You Which one of those was a lie? No, I did think watching The Crow, this is the ultimate movie where your cooler friend yep. like makes you watch it with them and they keep looking at it and you're like giving them a thumbs up. Like, <laughs> good uh, stuff. I don't know if my cooler friend would have given like... a fuck if I liked it or not. No. For me, the movie was SLC Punk. Yeah. My 13-year-old friend yeah. ch- showed it to me many times. Yeah. And I was a little scared of it because he's like, oh, he's a punk and he loves the devil, I think. And I didn't love the devil yet. That would go- come a few years later. Shh, he might hear you. I love you, sir. And, um, but yeah, I would. I didn't get it. I didn't think it was funny. I didn't think it was cool. But I had to just like nod along. Well, no comment. didn't have a death, so... No, I saw it. I saw it again as an adult, and it's like a sweet little charming movie. Is there not a death at the end? That's like really. Funny. I think there is. I don't remember it very well. I just oh, remember. And I only remember that. I oh, but that it's just you, you watch it as an adult. And you're like, oh, this is about like acceptance and coming of age, and everybody's kind of just wants the same things, just wants to be accepted and loved and be themselves. You want to be loved for who you are, etc. And when I'm 13, I'm like, this is scary. But my friends look at me and are like, I love this fucking shit. Yeah! Punk! Think of another movie that would be up there with that sort of feeling. One that I just pretended to like. Um, Pulp Fiction? That's happened. I've faked my way into liking things. You described yourself on the podcast before as something of a goth kid. So talk about that. Is that true? Were you were you flirting with gothicism? Uh, um, absolutely true. I b- was very close to my cousins growing up, as I've freaking said a million times. Um, and they're gorgeous. And I... That's a very strong feature. So. <laughs> your, your cousin, you say cousins, they're kind of like your sisters. It's uh, Yeah, and we're most all people, very similar in age. Just... So a lot of comparison of, between each other, what you have, and, and not necessarily by them, but always by me, because I always seemed on the losing end of that. Um, and that included looks. So I do think that contributed to me being more entertaining. Or inter- f- I like to think of myself as funny. Um, 
I, I, you know, it was a character building to not be the pretty one, but it, it fucked with me. And, well, and, you know, not having a father around, that really kind of kicked that thing into high gear. Sure. So, those things, I, I t- that, that left me wanting to just, if I just look completely different because it's my choice, then no one's going to be comparing me to, to my cousins because I, I'm a, it's apples to oranges. So, if I'm going to wear the same clothes from the gap and part my hair down the middle just like they do and get the highlights and the streaks... I don't have a fucking chance. So, you know, I had black hair and uh, really big jeans. I never went, like, glam goth. I just wore a lot of black. How old were you? I guess it started around 12 or 13 and then all the way till 16. So it's a so short it period away. of time. I don't know. It's a, I mean... It's long for a teenager, but it, it right. did go away. It was not a lifestyle you adopted. Well, I then. started getting curvy, um... I, I needed Stop, started getting what? Curvy. curvy. I grew a butt and my senior year was my best year of I was always rail thin, unattractive, you know, you know, the way skinny girls are. You don't feel like an adult or a woman or anything. You don't you don't have assets to show off so therefore you don't dress the part. And then once I grew a butt you by like, goth. You like goth <laughs> now it's all about butt. Did you have goth friends? Were you in the goth scene? Yes, but I was always a floater. Um, I was always the kind of person that would float between the raving, the raver kids, the goth kids. The um, there's no such thing as jocks. But I would say there's a straight edge group, the ones that are like in a youth group and don't do drugs, and then uh-huh. there's your, your preppy or cool kids that are like probably cheerleaders and you know what? Anyway, I wouldn't say I was any one thing, but as far as what I looked like, I looked more like I should be hanging out by the the goth tree. Did you have any which was non-goth a tree friends? Where there were, if you the, most of my friends weren't goth. Oh, okay. Again, I just didn't, I wanted to be the orange to their apple. So this was I would say most most people who probably go into any sort of subgroup in high school do it to fit in with the friends well, or or want I, to be like the friends that they're I'm leaving with. out something very important. Okay, who was goth was my boyfriend. Oh. Yeah, that he kind of controlled that whole deal um and he uh, he was my boyfriend for four years in high and he school. was a goth he tried um uh based on information i have about this gentleman uh from from outside of this show i don't know if i could say the thing i wanted to say but what do you, how would you sum up very succinctly what goth means a counterculture um th- sort of flirting with the it, it, it makes people question and assume a lot of things about you probably that you have some sort of wick and handbook sure. um that I mean, and I was a Christian, so I anything you could have assumed about me would have been completely wrong. <laughs> you were a Christian, but you loved Goth and Marilyn Manson, yeah. Which is when I did, and I'd pray for him. But you prayed for Marilyn Manson a lot. Yeah. Um. To like to, that he that he would stop come doing stop being away? or that his like you know ridiculous Catholic religion would have saved his soul or. <laughs> I wasn't just Christian. I was also of the opinion that anyone that wasn't exactly my sect was definitely going to hell. Um, yeah. So I I was even counter to that. I, w- I just never wanted to look like I was trying to fit in because I wasn't going to be able to. Okay. So, I, yeah. <laughs> well, so you're like a cafeteria goth. You're picking, you're picking the things that you like. Right, because even the music didn't match. Yeah, I... I have a have a nine inch nail or two or and a tool much later in life but like really goth music no like like i said i was far too sensitive too depressed oh but those are goth, like i was those are my goth- definition would be the definition of the goth personality is depressed love sick and like mm-hmm. um the where, where the the feeling of being in love and it being like a horror movie it's like I basically my... being like Edward Scissorhands or something. Ugh. Because at least in the goth music, it is about it is about like me and the person I love, mm-hmm. and it's us against the world. And we're, and we're gonna, gonna bury ourselves everybody. in a coffin yes. and live there like mole people. Um, yeah, I see what you're saying. Again, I wasn't true goth. I just looked it, and I was always bordering on candy raver. Um, it just... Well, what does that mean? Well, the rave scene was a, a whole thing. So the big pants weren't necessarily goth. I just wore a lot of black and black lipstick and black nails and had black hair and chokers. But I'd also sometimes wear, like, really colorful things. And, like, I had a, a belt that was a 
seat belt from a car mm-hmm. with bottle caps all over it. And I, I was all over the fucking place. Anything to not be compared to the hottie sitting next to me in algebra. Like, I'm, I'm getting looked at because I choose it. They're picking on me because I want it. Yeah. I had a belt with uh, Flame Boy and Wet Willie, the two cartoon characters from the World Industry Skateboard line. And a chain wallet. Wow. I was trying to be Those a skater. Those were banned from my school because oh. we had a lot of violence. They were <laughs> not allowed at my school either because we had uniforms. But on those occasions oh. where the whole school, the whole seventh grade, all 16 of us would get together for oh a dance God. party. Uh, that's my dance? time to shine. Show off my true personality. My birdhouse TV shirt. Then you do TV that shirt. spin move and your wallet comes out and it's still attached to you. How embarrassing. But practical. Okay. Uh, I comp- I contrast the... so, But if I if I had a scene that I was involved in, which I didn't because I didn't have friends until senior year a little bit. Mm-hmm. But it was the, the emo scene. I was peripherally... Oh, I would have said the, punk. Sure, but I played in bands and I, I was involved in the music scene and my band wasn't an emo band, but emo bands were the ones who You dabbled in some shows. screamo. I, I, I dab... No. Yeah, you'd scream. <laughs> you want me to... Yeah, screamo is a very different thing. I know. But... I have a lot. I like most of the bands that I still love are emo or emo influenced, but I contrast goth culture with emo culture. And what I see in emo culture is scorned men who think they're the loneliest, misunder- most misunderstood and lovesick people in the world. And as a result, they have a right to get exactly what they want from the woman that they yeah. love. And what's interesting, I mean, you're saying you're describing goth and you're describing emo at the same no, time. So the, so the difference, as I see it, is, and I could be totally wrong because I just know less about goth culture, but in emo music, the man who is scorned by the woman he loves gets his revenge by committing violence upon her, whereas in goth music, it's about grabbing your gal and you two do violence against the world. Like Bonnie and Clyde. So it seems much more... Less so like, Eminem, Eminem, more Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> um, uh, emo music is quietly like a lot more misogynistic and probably oh okay see you're coming at this whole thing as though it's driven by music alone and it wasn't that for me and and maybe that's because i've always had imposter syndrome a syndrome Uh and i never truly felt like i was pulling off any kind of thing i was going for it just was whatever um and maybe that's why I didn't have super goth friends, because then they'd fucking quiz me on some shit. And I don't know anything yeah. about any uh, no, and, morbid and like, angel or whatever the hell the, we're going to talk about. Yeah, this is all stuff. I, just, I love candles. <laughs> this and, is all just stuff I think about like now. I wasn't thinking about this at the time. No, I mean, I was only thinking about this, like people finding me out. I mean, me too. I, everybody feels like that. Yeah. Anyway. But so. I know we want to talk about the crow. I just love this goth conversation. Oh, no, yeah. Um, just keep going. What? Can I talk about the origins of the fra- of the term goth? I wish you would. Do you know what it comes Cathedral? from? Cathedral? Kind of. So there are like these examples in history, like uh, the, the, the word barbarian, mm-hmm. where it comes, it basically meant anyone who isn't a Greek. Ah, because the Greeks were sense. like, these fucking people who don't speak our language, they're like, burr, like a, burr, like burr, a, I can't understand this guy. Like a savage. I don't know what the origin of savage is. No, I'm just uh, to describe other in a derogatory way. Yes, yeah. but Someone the, word, the word by barbarian literally meant non-Greek, and they came up with the word because these people are speaking their own language, and it's like they're just saying, burr, burr, burr. Oh. And that's where they get the word barbarian. Uh, barbar- and since then, barbarian meant... Whoever is an other. Because they didn't see Burberry coming. That's a very posh. Okay, go ahead. In the t- in you know Romans always talked about barbarians outside the empire. Right. Um, you wouldn't have any inside. And so there were during during the Roman Empire there were these uh, tribes, these Germanic tribes outside the empire. They were called the Goths, and this is like an umbrella term basically for all these other tribes: the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths. They would come in and raid. Eventually, they took over. And once the empire fell, suddenly all this architecture evolved. Mm-hmm. It became yeah. less uh, less sophisticated and was replaced by sort of m- medieval architecture. With and the arches. The arches, yes. A lot of wrought iron. Uh-huh. What, what you th- when you think of oh, a castle, a, a, a cathedral, blacksmith. Well, I mean, you got your stained glass. You've got, you got more iron being used. I'm just saying it's this work that comes from a tradesman. So it would make sense if you had a lot of access to it because that's what your trade was. <laughs> so maybe... You know, it's for the lower class person because it's full of the products that fuck me. I don't know. No, I, no, you're right. You're following me. And 
once the Renaissance happened and people started rediscovering classical architecture, which just meant Roman architecture, mm -hmm. uh, started building things more classically, they would say all those ugly things we built in the Middle Ages, they're so gothic. Okay. To basically mean just other. That's non-Roman. That's the Germans. That's gothic. That's where that phrase comes from it's like not it's a one-to-one -one. okay so you're saying that the tribe itself the goths that literally lived outside uh -huh. they, they just had that name so we yep. don't know the origin of that part it's just they're just saying it's like that guy's name's garth it's like it's like just using it no, as, oh, a, no, I got as it. a stand in i for thought you other. were truly going to tell me the origin what, of the no, word no, you're st i still yeah just like it was it is from the Flash forward to the 1800s, and suddenly a literature pops up. The 17 and 1800s literature pops up. Horror, horror stories that largely take place in Gothic settings, Gothic castles and cathedrals. Yeah, Gothic literature. Then flash forward to the 1970s. It's England. It's Europe. And these bands start popping up. Joy Division, Bauhaus, The Cure. And they love Gothic literature, and they love horror movies. Give me an example of Gothic literature. Would that be like Edward Allen... Edgar Frankenstein. Yeah, Edgar Allan Poe, Poe, Dracula. Anything with a raven. Yep. Um, these bands rediscover all this gothic literature, these uh, monster movies from the 30s, horror movies, horror iconography, the occult, witchcraft. Candles. Use lots it all and as, lots as their of imagery. candles. Everything and, is a stained video. Right. Uh-huh. And, uh, the, I mean, The Crow is like every music video from the 90s. What was... Oh, it, it mashed into... I mean, they each goth musician after the crow just took a part of that set piece and made it their thing because it does feel like a mashup it feels like the godfather if yeah it's like the urtext of everything it's crazy right. that it's i've like never seen this movie the, it's where they it's the bible of where yep. you it's it's, it's where nine Rosetta inch nails Stone. was born from a little egg it's not but i feel like it could have been born on that set no i know what you mean it seems like this is the key to yes. everything like, this is how like we understand everything that skinny actor unlocked Trent Reznor. Like, it might be the thing we need to preserve from the second half of the 20th century. And maybe the crow a laid generations. an egg and it was Trent Reznor. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe, baby. And uh, so, gothic. That was gothic rock. And the people who loved gothic rock, <laughs> rock called themselves the goths. And then eventually just their style got adopted by people who were Am goths. I dancing goth right Here's the thing. I've never... Do I look like I'm... I yes, dancing? she's doing a very... You don't have to explain it. I just want you to... Very Joy Division dance. Yeah. Now... <laughs> like com little, I was wondering. little compulsions what people who dress goth mm -hmm. are usually emulating characters from movies or sometimes are emulating characters from movies. Like Sellington, the girl from Adam's family or Wednesday Harley Quinn or whoever but I don't such think, example I don't think I couldn't think of any movies where characters are themselves goths they're just like in this movie uh Sarah Sarah dresses goth mm -hmm. but she's not she wouldn't identify as a goth. That's just how she's dressed. Look at the town. I don't think it'd be very original if she did. It seems like everyone is, even the cops. So I don't know if that if that you're saying it doesn't mean anything about her that she wears fishnets. No, I, I'm wondering. At what point would well, she announce that, that she's goth? That, but also, are any she goths watching friends. movies about characters who are goths, or are they watching characters who dress up and in a weird way? But not because they're goths, but because oh, okay, you're of saying, some other reason. Okay, you're saying things get, like, pulled in yep. to what goth is because they will identify some kind of quirk. They Like steampunk. Mm -hmm. Like, they'll see something in a movie that didn't intend to be goth at all, but they're like, now that's goth, that, bitches. Love, love that. Do you think, I feel like I feel like Sarah's would, like, kicked off the whole Doc Martin thing. Those Doc Martens was amazing. So what was the, sorry, you, what was the, I, I know so little about fashion. What is the Doc Martens? Doc Martens are, Martin. are the boots she wore, which is not a skateboarding shoe, so you, so you definitely recognize them as not being what you would typically see on a skateboard. Uh, they're, you know, past the ankle. They've got a very specific rubber sole. That's how you know they're Doc Martens, because it's a clear amber. Um, they were expensive. It says Doc Martens on the side. They're leather. Impossible to fucking walk in. You have to walk like Frankenstein, which makes sense. But anyway, boots just in general are very goth. They made me look very stumpy, so I never, I didn't get into that. But you know what works for a stumpy short person? You unlace those bad boys, and you just hope you don't fall out of your shoe every time you Ugh, walk. That's torturous. But, but you know, it's like it's kind of like the Rocky thing. Like he cracks an egg and drinks it. And then work out people from then on. Go, that's what you do with eggs. I don't want to get into this again. But I'm not getting into it. I'm saying, but that was a practical thing in the movie. It wasn't actually to tell. We never found Stop! verification that that's true. 
can I fucking finish my point? I'm sorry. It's like that. Then you watch this movie. He did not lace up his giant lace up Doc Martens because that was his like way of dressing. A crow was leading him to different things. The crow led him to clothes. He put him on. And then the crow was taking him to a bar. So he didn't have time to lace him up. And I just think that's interesting. Mm. It's a... It's practical in the movie and then becomes fashionable outside of it. There you go. Yeah, story reasons. And then everyone got a crow. Exactly. Story reasons. People copy the product, but not for the same reasons. Right. It wasn't a fashion statement in the, in the movie. It was a, I don't have time to tie my shoes. Yeah. Because they lace all the way up to my fucking kneecap. I think it's interesting. Like, the only thing... That seems like it was notable about this mo- movie, or the the most important thing is that the actor died. That was what this movie it saved was about in a fucked up way. It's and we haven't movie. mentioned that at all. We haven't mentioned the movie at all. I know we've been talking about, but goths. I think it's, it's funny that it's it's just you you can get far enough away from something where s- some sort of external context doesn't seem important anymore. Like, I bet you're saying we don't need to talk about the storyline because it, what we need to talk about is its reputation. Hmm? No, just then, pointing out. No, it, no it, it'd be like talking about the Dark Knight, but not bringing up that Heath Ledger died. But I think okay, like, that's my whole point is that we have not. I even think started twenty years digging. from now, people won't bring up Heath Ledger dying. It'd just be like, what a great performance. Uh, for me, this movie is all about the fact that that Brandon Lee okay. died, um, and it it because death. So I would have been nine when this movie came out, and and twelve is my recollection of when I would have been faking that it was one of my movies. Um, twelve or thirteen, and it would be the. That would be around the time when I started realizing suicide and attempts at suicide were a thing. Um, and it, this this movie is just for an age group that's very fascinated with death and very, like, romantic about it. Um, and then the fact that someone actually died while, do, while doing it two months before it was finished. And then they resume production months later with the blessing of the mother it's just like it, every teenager must see this shit and the fact that his fiance he was going to get married a week after finishing the movie and the actor dies in the movie a day before his wedding day the fact that it was a prop accident an accident because they insisted on making their own dummy cartridges for the for the movie they didn't buy they didn't buy their blanks they made them so the way i un- I had to understand this. I don't know anything about guns, but the, I don't either. I when you me. when you see um, in a movie, if you see a shot of of bullets of a, a you know bullets in a chamber, those are dummies. They're they, not real bullets. They're the real fronts of a that right. It's the real front of a butt of a of a bullet without the charge or the powder oh. behind it to make it. Project. But then when a gun is shot in a movie, then a blank is shot, and that's a different. That's different because a blank a blank doesn't have an actual projectile. A blank makes the noise. But doesn't yep. shoot anything out. Right. But the front is, it's all still part of the, it, they're not two different things. It's just the front looks real, the back's worth, something's missing. What happened was they got a dummy cartridge. They were making their own. Lodged. They were the making gun. their own where they removed the powder and the, um, well, whatever makes the bullet get out of the gun. They removed the, that out of all of them and they just missed some of one. Uh, just enough for at a certain range to make a projectile deadly. And because they were shooting, that shooting scene was so close, it it, it was deadly. But, uh, and, uh, yeah, right, nothing was supposed to come out of the gun, but the, char- the the force of shooting off a blank caused this thing to actually come out of the gun, yeah. too. I don't know what Enough of a charge was in it. And it hit him, and then he drops, and people are just like, well, this is part of the scene. Yeah. And then blood, so- like, blood just starts coming out of him. That's that's one of like my biggest nightmares is you dying and people not people thinking like part of a joke. <laughs> but how long do you think they was he a joke? No, I don't know. No, I know. but I think myself like that's collapsing. why you shouldn't do pranks, you fuckers. I've been trying to tell my kid this since she was born. Practical funniness is not actual funniness, and it's the the damn crying the wolf. The lowest form of you're comedy. You're crying wolf. You want me to really believe you're dead? Quit playing dead, you possum. So he dies he has only a few days he, he left dies of after six hours of surgery yeah and it is a huge deal i've always you know like heard the name brandon lee and i assumed there must be something if he's so he's so famous there must be some reason like independent of he died but it really is just well he had a famous father but there's tons of 
children of famous people. Uh, but his connection to his father's death is much more interesting. It is. You want? Yeah, I I didn't know any of this stuff. Yeah, this is crazy. Well, that. Do you know what, what age Brandon was when he died? He was he was twenty eight. Twenty. Okay, his dad was thirty two. Yeah. And that his dad died two months before the end of the production for what would be his biggest movie, which was Enter the Dragon. Uh-huh. So he dies before seeing his real fame, or and he, he had not yet like became a real thing in the United States. Just become yeah, um, household name superstar. Right, and same with Brandon Lee dying just right before. Um, yeah, he was eight years old when his dad died, and he died because of something he was sort of because of something he was doing for the production of the movie that uh, Bruce Lee died of a brain endemia endema endema how do you say that like a hemorrhage endemia um, and they realized later that it was probably a mixture of some kind of painkiller plus some sort of like innocent thing like aspirin he was not a person who took drugs or anything but during filming of a you know, a very physical movie where you do all your own stuff. He he took something because it hurt, and mm-hmm. he was kicked, and then that made him drop to the floor. I think he was kicked, and that caused it. So it's just, both of them died doing their... With Bruce, there were all these, you know, there were conspiracy yeah. theories. He was actually killed by the triad, right, right, right. the Chinese uh, mob. There, Did you see the thing about he was he had a movie... Where in the movie he's playing an actor who gets shot by somebody on set who is Holy using what is supposed to be fun, but it's actually a real gun. I did not know that. That literally That's happens in a movie of his. Wow. Yeah. And then 20 years later, his kid dies that way. And then there were conspiracy theories about Brandon Lee's death um, that seem like they've all vanished. I yeah. mean, you can get them on YouTube. But I like watched this news report from the time, and it was all about who really killed Brandon right. Lee. Because it's just so hard to accept that anyone that young could die at all especially as in a glamorous a field as being a movie star and i'm fucking amazed that any movies get made with all the work like there's a gun technician on set who examines the gun before you use it and he had got sent home early that day and if he looked at it would have realized something was wrong with the gun they wouldn't have used it yeah i'm amazed shit like this doesn't happen all the time so i mean that's the major thing about this movie and when you're certain kind of um you know kid or teenager Sort of fascinated not, with death is, 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 learning. is learning. Not a certain kind, Matt. A certain All kind? kinds. Okay. Every kind. So. What do you mean? Well, ages six to nine, this is for nearly every kid. This is when your understanding of death is, um, is more clearly developed. Um, there's an increased interest in physical and biological aspects to death, uh, like. Uh, well, oh, but this is also where magical thinking kicks in. Um, like if you're going to be, if you're religious, you're going to buy into your fa- your family's religion or come up with your own. This is when that really takes hold. Is six to nine. Um, that that's when you finally understand death is uh, not temporary, and you think of death as more of like a person than a thing. So like a ghost, death is a ghost, or death is what turns people into a ghost. You, you're not gone, you know. So it's like it's like embodied by a thing, not a place. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So then nine to twelve. Is and, and that would be the age I was when I watched this movie. Um, this is your concept of death is pretty much the kind that your concept you'll have for your entire adult life. Um, that's when you start to wonder what a dead body looks like. Your um, is it stiff? Is it cold? Is blood blue? Um, and you start to develop the, a strong tendency to, uh, of denial when it comes to death, but that it won't happen around you, near you, to you. Um, and then, sorry, I'm almost done. Now, here's the age range of people who probably were watching this movie. I, I think I was too young to see it. But so 12 and older, that is when it, it, you get a strong feeling of immortality, that, that you're, so, you're not just in a denial. You're not, you're not the kind of person that would die. Um, it's also when you start searching for things like what's the meaning of life and what's my special mission and why doesn't anyone besides me understand the implications of life and death. It's like it's perfect time to become emo or goth or you're sad, weepy. Like it's not a good look to be a jock who's a deep thinker. So you probably, if you're gonna, if you're gonna have these really hard thoughts, you probably need the costume to go with it. I guess I don't know. Uh, maybe that's why the best music is written around this time too and oh 
and due to to television and movies, they see loss, experience as death is easy to deal with. Which that's interesting. I never, yeah, the characters always do usually move on. Um, and there's a lot of philosophizing about death at this time and romanticizing. So anyway, that's why it's just, suicide was just such a topic around this age for me. Anyway, when I when I was in high school, I feel like. I was particularly surrounded by people who had a, like a death fantasy or de- a romantic notion of it or a feeling that they'd be more special if they committed suicide and w- leave behind a better legacy or or maybe some weird thing where they're going to commit suicide but not die from it or like it, it's just this like fantasy of death making them special mm-hmm. when when it's like one of the only things that's true about everyone um but anyway, it's interesting to read that note, like literally chemically in your brain. This is exactly because all these things are clicking into into place at this time in your adolescence. Lots and lots of kids, even if they don't dress goth, are probably having these thoughts. It's just certain ones are more drawn into it and, and will surround themselves with music and movies and other people who look and sound the way. So they're just a little more morose. Mm-hmm. Um, then for me, I was also around drugs at this time and I had two or three friends die from heroin overdoses. So, or not even, one I was close to and others were like further away. But just the fact that people my age could die. Mm -hmm. um, And there's just a certain kind of person who flirted with suicide all the time. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me like it's about control, about feeling out of control and trying to get back some of it by by owning it. Yeah, because I mean, I, I remember a time in my life becoming very fixated on death, not in the I'm going to, to die but just sort of like i have more control over my life now and as a result i could die and i remember thinking about that a lot and a byproduct of that is getting all fancy um writing a jam uh having loving a movie about an avenging angel and this i never this thought sort of him as an angel cart- well the poster says like believe in angels or something because it's like what it like expanded crow's wings and oh they're actually angel's wings and his cat's name is gabriel so th- th- that's just what i mean about about getting very very uh very magic about it like i'm i'm fixated on death but i'm gonna make it into a comic book because i love that kind of thing no all right sure yeah well and it's a way of making an angel and just it, like look angels can come in all different Shape, sizes, and, and looks. Just because I dress this way doesn't mean I'm not a good person. Look at all these horrible people around me, and I dress like this and wear this makeup, but I'm the good guy. I, I, yeah, I think that's a big fantasy that right people like, like being odd accepted people have. for looking. It's not even Halloween. What you all painted up for? Like, I may I, be weird looking, but I'm the most morally righteous exactly. and upstanding citizen, and I care about children and women. This cat and everyone being nice and okay. And I even like this cop, who, by the way, is my favorite part of the movie. <laughs> so, movie, movie, what'd you think? We watched the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie last week, and you were making a lot of huffing noises during that. And you were doing I that cringed. again last night, too, while we watched The Crow. I cringed a lot of times during the... I mean, there is so much about it that's really heavy-handed, a very cartoonish. Um, but I really started to enjoy it more toward the last 15 minutes. Um, so I don't I know maybe maybe because I kind of accepted the goofiness of the of all the characters like they're 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 overwritten and that's on purpose. Oh yeah, it's a cartoon. Right. Um, but not but, enough. Right. Like and and, and he maybe because I've seen Heath Ledger after where like I've seen it all done better. That's the thing. And better written. If the Heath Ledger Joker didn't exist, maybe this would be more of a or revelation. Or even to the see. other joke, even Jack Nicholson's Joker. There, there's there's people who are maniacal and insane, and but he's insane and the good guy, and he, he does this like Whoa! <laughs> laugh a couple times. It's like I where are we going with it? Like you're driven mad by love. I, I also didn't buy the love story. They saw. They showed not one clip that made me think those guys were in love. They just seemed like they fuck with candles a lot, and Ward. That's velvet. what love is. Oh, but that's that's why I think we're, I think that's why so many young people right. it wasn't are drawn too, to it because it doesn't. Deep. It's not, a real thing would turn them off. Like real romance is people like fighting over what they're gonna eat for dinner and shit like that. And that's why we're so red hot in love. That's right. 
but this is a very sensual movie. A lot of it's hands very, caressing yes. faces. A lot of handles. back, a lot of back muscles. Yeah, yeah, a lot of hand going up a back, a sweaty <laughs> back. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's I've. You, you, you make it on that level, it's definitely going to appeal to some 14-year-olds. The bad guys are ridiculous. They're so... I mean, Tintin. What is his fucking problem? Um, he's like, yeah, I murder because it's fun. Like, well, all right. Good line. But the Hudson character, the cop, he is, he, he's the yes, he is the best part of the movie. Yeah. There's a scene pretty late in the movie where he's just walking through the precinct and he's like snapping and smiling like, oh, he's just so happy to be working this case. Of this, of this, he's back on the beat, and this is after he's talked to the crow have come back to life. That so would he's put like, a resurrection mindset. exists, and I love it. But, 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 I'm, 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 <laughs> these past one year was not for nothing. They never really explain why it is that he was taken from off of detective and put on back on the beat. Like, what did he do so wrong? I didn't with try that? to follow the details of I any of this. I think it was shit. that he didn't find one murder, which that's kind of sad. I mean, this lady was. Yeah, he found her. Um. Yeah, I, I didn't... I wanted to like this movie more. I don't think... It's not very good. It's not even very fun. Maybe if the Heath Ledger Joker didn't exist, this would be more interesting. Brandon Lee, is, there's something about him. He's very magnetic. He has a physicality that's very impressive. Would have been a big star. And I'm very grateful that Johnny Depp was not in this movie. Oh, fuck, yes. Because you can see that version of of him. Yeah. Um, Maybe he, I mean, he was good back then. Maybe he would have done something interesting. But... Uh, I, there is something to this Brandon Lee performance. I can see why. It doesn't grab me at first, but I end up liking him more as it goes on uh-huh. for whatever reason. Um, the bad guys are all over the fucking place. And they never explain what is up with the vampire couple. Are they brother and sister for real? Why do they take out eyeballs? That's how are they just they are. No, but are, I thought, like, at least if they're vampires, this is making more sense. They, they fuck someone till she died. That's the first time you meet them. That's how you know they're bad. I don't understand. But he's the leader of a gang dressed like a pirate. I don't. How does he get respect? Oh, he takes eyes. That's wrong. But the whole crime syndicate didn't make sense. It, it, nothing happens in the town without him knowing. My read because you're your Pantene Pro V fresh hair. My read on it is that it's a movie about wrestling characters. Yeah, that would make more sense. And the thing that I knew about the Crow my whole life was that uh, it was the origin of Sting, the great. WCW right. wrestler. And let me tell you about Sting. Uh, Sting in the 80s and early 90s was a California surfer bro. That was his character. He had a colorful face paint. Is it was Sting? Yeah, Sting. I'm Sting. Not Wipeout? Hey guys, I'm Sting. And I'm Stinger. Bzzz. He had really like bleach blonde hair sticking straight up. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the character was sort of a, a, a weaning in the, the mid '90s. It seemed very out of date. It seemed very it? old fashioned. Didn't have okay staying power. Well, he changed. He completely overhauled his character by just becoming the crow. Um, That'll do it. By dressing exactly like the crow with the crow face paint, he carried around a black baseball bat, and he stopped talking. And suddenly, he oh. started showing up in the rafters of uh, wrest- of basketball arenas where these wrestling shows were being held. And they just like put a spot like, oh my God, there's Sting up there. What's he, what's he doing? And he wouldn't do anything. He would just sit there and watch. And then sometimes he would descend down to the ring. Ah! Oh, the first time he appeared, he did have a bird of prey sitting on his shoulder. It was it was like a hawk, but goofy. I've watched it earlier. It was I couldn't tell what it was. But then the bird goes down to the ring and all of the wrestling villains are like looking at the bird and they're scared. And one of them is about to hit the bird with a wrestling belt. But then decides not to. And um, this is how Sting becomes one of the most popular characters um, of the late 90s by just being the crow. Because what a look that I is. I mean, you're going to be in every poster because you're going to have, you know, you need that variety. And he Sting's uh, the he was Sting was a good guy, just oh. like the crow. Ah. And the people that Sting was going up against were the NWO. They were a, they were a heel faction. That's what it's called. A he- heels are bad guys. Factions are when bad guys get together. <laughs> they were just like the, the bad guys in this movie. Uh, where mur- murder is fun, murder is good. Um, and so for Let's years, Sting murder. by himself descended from the rafters uh, and and put some brought some avenging justice onto the NWO. Uh, I didn't know he was a good guy. Yep, a toe. If you can see, <laughs> yeah, the characters in in uh, 
in in the crow a movie where people do wrestling moves constantly where people are doing somersaults uh for a guy who masters splashes. in uh, martial arts they don't use any of it he might have did a high kick one time the wrestling seems right at home um so that was my that was my only exposure to to uh to the crow the crow sting um is what the I The crow sting. Can the we crow call sting. this episode that? When I was a kid and people would talk about sting, like non-wrestling people were talking about like the police musician sting. I assume they were talking about the stinger from wrestling. It's like, oh, you know sting too. Dad. Right, right. Dad. Dad. Um, so, the so the crow. crow. <laughs> it's a <laughs> shitty movie. No. Very, very important though. Right. Preserve it's it it 82 on Rotten Tomatoes. Well, people are stupid. Uh, if Roger Ebert loved it, he gushed oh over it. Oh my god! But um, I'm hip. I'm with it. Dirk, dirk, dirk. But any final thoughts? I get why I pretended to like it, and then, and I I get it, but I don't want it, and it makes me I'm sad. I'm sad that he died. <laughs> That's what I mean. No, no agreed. Sad. sad. I agree <laughs> that it's sad, sad that he died. <laughs> Uh, I think I probably thought it was apocryphal, whatever. I, like, it seemed too... It seemed like one of those rumors, like, that there's a shadow of a a little person Munchkin from a... Killed yeah. Killed in the Boys of Oz. Well, no, not killed. Who killed himself, and there you can well, see the shadow killed. of his hanging... Killed. Anyway, it seemed like that. Even when I told you, oh, you know, that guy really died. When we were talking about this movie, I... I part of me was thinking i bet that's not true and it's fucking true it's just you can't write this and stuff. all i knew was he died i didn't know he got fucking shot by a prop in the middle of filming right uh yeah they filmed they got eight million more dollars from miramax to finish the movie by using stunt double Weinstein some cgi is such a nice guy uh, compositing his face onto his stunt double right but most of the scenes that he hadn't filmed were him before becoming the crow Okay. Said, oh, that's why it. they they use that photo so much. Him and the band, they 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 really lean on that. Hey, how come he didn't visit his bandmates, bandmates once he came back? back? Yeah, what the fuck kind of band member is that? He had his guitar. He shredded. They were so they, you know they're fucking mad. All he was ever talking about was Shelly. Shelly. So anyway, loadbearingbeams.com is our website. Loadbearing on Twitter. Loadbearing Beams on Instagram. I'm doing our social media wrap up. Wrap wrap it up then. Anything else? I feel like I had something to say, but... You all for listening. Wow. What a coup. What a gift you've given us. <laughs> it can't always rain, but you make it shine. Oh. I wrote a song once that began with the lyric, Oh, oh how I miss the rain. So I'm kind and of And then a, you were... I'm kind of an Eric DeRaven remembered myself. Remembered the Deserts Miss the Rain song, and you thought, Shit, I'm not a lady from the 80s. I shouldn't write this song. Exactly. Oh, okay. Okay, love you, bye. Three, four. Everybody, love me.